Thank you all so much for joining us and uh, welcome to the 2024 Arch Respite Research Summit. This is our capstone event for the Arch Committee for Advancement of Respite Research and the uh, culmination of the last five years of the Arch uh, Respite Research Initiative. Uh, I'm Jill Kagan with the Arch National Respite Network and Resource Center, and we're really so delighted to see so many of you um, have joined us today. We have a really exciting, information-packed three days. Uh, the summit will convene each afternoon, today, tomorrow, and Wednesday, and we really hope you'll be able to join us for all three days. But if not, um, the event is being recorded, and uh, we'll post it on the ARCH website and let you know uh, when that happens. Uh, Marsha, I think you can go to the first slide. Uh, just a few logistics before we get started. Um, the agendas for all three days uh, can be found on the summit website, which is at the link uh, on the slide, and Marsha will be posting that in a minute. Uh, also posted on the website uh, are all of the speakers' PowerPoint slides uh, for today and tomorrow, and uh, Wednesdays will be up eventually as well, uh, as well as their speaker bios, uh, and those links will be placed uh, in the chat also. I did want to let you all know that we have a change for Wednesday's agenda. Uh, we unfortunately had to cancel Tawara Good's presentation on the release of the Ensuring Cultural and Linguistic Competence Guide for respite researchers due to some unavoidable scheduling conflicts. Uh, but we will be rescheduling that as a separate uh, webinar at a later date, and you'll all be notified uh, of that as well. Uh, one more logistical note, you've already heard me mention Marsha's name. Marsha O'Malley is with us today to deal with any technology uh, issues uh, that we have. If, we're, if you're having any issues at all, please, uh, you can privately uh, messenger uh, her through the chat. And again, her name is Marsha O'Malley. Next slide, please. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with ARCH, we're funded by the Administration for Community Living to provide training and technical assistance uh, to the Lifespan Respite Program grantees, uh, to their state respite coalition partners, to other state and local agencies and providers, and also to family caregivers uh, and the respite field more broadly. Uh, and I want to take this opportunity to thank the Administration for Community Living for their support over the last 15 years and really for helping to make this event possible today. The next slide, please. And to help us get a better sense who, uh, of who is participating today, uh, we'd be very grateful if you could uh, respond to this first poll question. Um, if you can, please tell us what best describes your role. Uh, we know from the registration list that we have pretty broad representation across disciplines, and I'm sure that'll show up uh, in the poll. Uh, what's interesting is that among those who register, not only do we have broad representation across disciplines, but I'm so excited that our participants hail uh, from across the U.S., from 39 states in the District of Columbia, as well as internationally. We had some folks from Australia, Canada, and South Africa register. Um, if you're from another country that I didn't mention, you can please let us know that in the chat. And thank you so much for your interest in these issues and really for helping us make this a global um, event. Let's see how many people... We'll give everyone else another second to respond to the poll. I think you can end it, Marsha, and share the results. If you hit stop, sh oh, I'm sorry. Um, look at this, we do, as I suspected, have a pretty broad representation across disciplines. Um, respite providers making up a significant percentage as well as government agencies and a fair number of researchers and evaluators. So, and even a few caregivers. So thank you all very much um, for being with us today. Next slide, please. We do have a... Um, a fantastic planning team, and I want to thank them for the countless hours they 
put in to pull this all together and doing it all with good cheer. Uh, Kim Whitmore with Marquette University College of Nursing uh, has been with us the whole way on our research initiative leading that effort. Uh, Susan Summers and Cassandra Furman with ARCH. Well, Ar Cassandra is now retired, but uh, she and Susan have done an amazing amount of work with our innovative and exemplary uh, respite services evaluation grantees, and you're going to be hearing a lot more about that tomorrow. Again, special thank you to Marsha O'Malley with Canva Video for helping us with the technology. And I also wanted to acknowledge Sarah Taves um, with the Bo Boise State University, who's going to be uh, on the meeting with us for the next few days as she's preparing the summary uh, of the event. Next slide, please. And of course, I'd be remiss if I did not thank the members of the Committee for Advancement of Respite Research, uh, affectionately known as the CAR. And I'm going to be saying CAR from now on because otherwise it's a lot of words to say. Um, they have shared their expertise and provided guidance to ARCH every step of the way since uh, we convened them in 2020 to help us advance our respite research agenda. Uh, and on the committee, we have academic researchers, advocates, funders, and we're so fortunate that a number of our members of the committee will be presenting over the next few days, but all of them have really played uh, significant roles in helping to craft the white papers and research framework that you're going to be learning about today. Next slide, please. Um, before I introduce our first speaker, Lori Stahlbaum, who's going to present a brief welcome, I wanted to just quickly share uh, an overview of the agenda. Uh, and a, as I mentioned, a link to today's agenda will also be placed in the chat. Uh, after the, this welcome and background that we're doing right now, uh, Dr. Whitmore will, who, as I said, facilitates the CAR, and Sarah Swanson, uh, another member of the CAR, will be presenting on the seminal work uh, of the committee. Uh, including measuring the value of respite, the value of respite model and framework, uh, and our newest publication, uh, recommended common data elements for respite research. Next slide, please. And the next panel um, we're incredibly excited about uh, includes presenters who are going to discuss several major national uh, research evaluation and data collection efforts and uh, share with us how these efforts might align uh, with the CARS work. And then the panel will be followed by a facilitated panel discussion uh, before we wrap up. And we'll have hopefully some time uh, for Q&A from all of you as well. Next slide. Uh, one more quick polling question. Um, the CAR has aligned its foundational work uh, with the goals of the national strategy to support family caregivers. And you're going to be hearing a lot about the strategy today. So we thought it might be helpful to know how familiar are you with the national strategy to support family caregivers, if you don't mind uh, responding uh, quickly to the poll. Okay, we've got 87% of people responding, so we can end the poll. Um, it's it's pretty evenly split here, um, with 32% of you not at all familiar, uh, and 29% very familiar, and the rest of you some is in between with somewhat familiar. So I'm glad we're going to be talking a little bit about what it is um, for the next few minutes. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Lori Stahlbaum with the Administration for Community Living um, to say a few words of welcome. Um, she has served, uh, next slide please, I'm sorry. Um, she has served as the co-lead for the Ray's Family Caregiving Council and the Council to Support Grandparents Raising Grandchildren. Uh, and she oversees the grand families uh, and kinship support network. And we're really proud and grateful to work with her as the team lead for the Lifespan Respite Care Program, as well as uh, the federal project officer for our Lifespan Respite Technical Assistance uh, and Resource Center uh, and other special projects. So thank you, Lori, so much for being with us um, today. My pleasure. Um, thank you, Jill. Um, 
Well, hello and welcome, everybody. Um, yes, I do have the very good fortune to be the federal project officer for ACL's Lifespan Respite Technical Assistance and Resource Center run by ARCH, as well as other projects related to the Lifespan Respite Care Program, as Jill mentioned. ARCH, um, under Jill's, Jill's direction, as many of you know, does so many things to help strengthen ACL's Lifespan Respite Care Program including focusing on respite research to, to better meet the needs of caregivers across the lifespan. And actually, ARCH, uh, Jill, ARCH, the Respite Initi Research Initiative began over 10 years ago. So this week's summit is going to focus on the work that the ARCH and the members of the CAR, Committee for Advancement of Respite Research, have been working on since the last Respite Research Summit, which was held in September 2020. So although the CAR was already working on ways to improve research, data, findings, and practices, to, oh, I keep losing my paper, sorry. Um, it keeps falling down. Um, to enhance and expand evidence-based respite research, in 2022, ACL released the first ever national strategy to support family caregivers. Uh, the strategy contains five goals one of which, Goal 5, stated the need to, quote, expand data, research, and evidence-based practices, end quote. Within Goal 5, the members of the RAISE Family Caregiving Council and the Council to Support Grandparents Raising Grandchildren identified three specific outcomes, which are outcome one, shared data systems with consistent data sets. This highlights the need to ensure that when researchers design studies, a common set of data is used so it is consistent with the classifications used. Outcome two, more research on practices that benefit family caregivers. This includes prioritizing research into advancing equity for unserved and underserved caregiving populations with strong consideration of diversity and cultural effectiveness. And outcome three, translation of research into interventions to support family caregivers. This includes conducting research, consistent research, into culturally adaptable, adaptable family caregiver interventions for a range of circumstances and translating that existing research for delivery into clinical and social services systems, such as the Lifespan Respite Program. So during this week's summit, you're going to learn about how the CARS work has helped inform national, state, and local research and evaluation initiatives. But you're also going to find out how it fully aligns with Goal 5 in the national strategy, even though they started before we did. And um, I hope you find it enlightening. And I can put a link to the National Family Caregiver Support Strategy um, in the chat for those, or give it to Marsha, however you do that. For those who are less familiar, if you'd like to become familiar, we have a two-page uh, two infographic that kind of boils it down in a nutshell. So thank you all for being here, and thank you for including me, and looking forward to a great three, three days. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lori. Um, we always appreciate your involvement and your support of the work that we're doing. Uh, we did put a link to the national strategy in the chat, and I want to call everyone's attention uh, to that we that links will be posted in the chat as people are speaking. So you might want to keep your chat open um, as the presenters are going through their slides so that you can see the so you can link to those um, issues and products as they're being talked about. Um, next slide, please. ARCH has devoted a lot of time uh, to advancing a respite research agenda, and many of you may be thinking, why have we done this? <laughs> um, it's really central to everything that we do, and research and evaluation are just very important to respite and to most of everything that we do uh, for many reasons. Um, as we grow the availability of respite services and programs across the country, um, as we hope we will do increasingly given the support from the national strategy, uh, and start to explore new models of service, 
uh, efficacy testing and outcome evaluation let us know that uh, they let us know if what we're building is actually working. Uh, we want to know what the uh, respite is doing to benefit family caregivers and those they care for. Uh, is it improving their quality of life and their well-being? Is it impacting society as a whole? Um, research and evaluation also allows programs to engage in continuous quality improvement uh, to ensure that the excellence and person and family centeredness of the services they are providing are ongoing. And building an evidence base for respite services, of course, also justifies our advocacy for new services uh, and new public and private funding streams. And we know how important that is. Uh, next slide, please. Before I talk a little bit about our respite research in initiative, can you tell us how familiar are you with our research initiative and with the work of the Committee for Advancement of Respite Research? Just out of curiosity. Okay, we've got about 80% having completed the poll. It looks like, again, spread fairly evenly. Only 17% of you are very familiar with the national strategy, uh, and the rest of you are either not at all familiar or somewhat familiar. So um, you're going to hear a little bit about it from me today. I won't be able to go into as much, much depth as I would like, but there'll be plenty of links for you to go and visit um, the ARCH website to learn more if you're interested. Next slide, please. Uh, with support from ACL, ARCH undertook this respite research initiative way back in 2013. As Lori mentioned, it's been more than 10 years. Uh, we convened at that time an expert panel on respite research. And the first thing we did was a literature review and published an annotated bibliography. Again, you can find that on the website. Uh, it told us that there were a lot of gaps in the evidence base for res respite and many, many methodological issues uh, that were impeding the publication of robust findings. And the panel deliberated for 18 months and the work culminated in the publication of a research agenda from the expert panel on respite research that included recommendations and a research framework uh, for conducting focused research on respite care. Uh, we spent the next few work years working with funders and researchers to implement the panel's recommendations to expand and improve opportunities for new research. Uh, and then we provided those findings, kind of a, a status report uh, at our first respite research summit in 2020. And we found that while we had made some progress, there was still a long way to go. Uh, and we convened a new committee for advancement of respite research that you've already heard so much about at that time. Uh, and they've been working diligently since 2020. And it's the work of this committee um, uh, that you're going to learn uh, more about today. Next slide, please. And back to the national strategy, and Lori's already mentioned this, um, right around the time that we announced the formation of the CAR, uh, ACL had been convening the Rays Family Caregiving Advisory Council and the Council to support grandparents raising grandchildren. So we knew uh, that recommendations would soon be forthcoming from both councils. So we charged the CAR to be prepared to respond to any recommendations that were focused uh, on research. From the start, uh, the CAR was really committed to aligning its work with these recommendations, which in 22, 2022 became embedded uh, in the national strategy to support family caregivers, specifically as goal five, uh, to expand data research and evidence-based practices to support family caregivers. So fortunately, we were a little bit ahead of the game and prepared to um, respond appropriately. Um, as I said, Laurie detailed um, what the strategies recommended rega regarding caregiving research, and you're gonna hear more about it later today uh, from one of our speakers from the National Alliance for Caregiving, when he talks about their ACL funded creating and advancing caregiving research uh, and evidence care network. Uh, so that's our whirlwind introduction to Arch's work uh, and to background on our respite research initiative that has resulted in this event today. 
Next slide, please. Now I would like to introduce again, once again, to you, Dr. Kim Whitmore, who is an assistant professor at the College of Nursing at Marquette University. Uh, Kim, as a member of the CAR, has also been facilitating the committee, as I said, since its inception in 2020. And she's done an amazing job leading the work and is the primary author of two of the CAR's major products. Uh, she's also going to serve as the facilitator of the summit over the next three days. And I'm extremely pleased to now hand the reins over to her uh, to move us forward with the agenda. So Kim, it's all yours. Great. Thank you so much, Jill. Um, it truly has been an honor to be so connected to the work of ARCH and to help facilitate the CAR. Thank you to all the members of the committee for their their support and their work over the past few years. It's just been such an incredible experience to connect with each of you individually and collectively as a group. So I wanna talk just a little bit about what the purpose of the CAR is. We've talked a little bit about this already, but just to um, get everyone on the same page of what we were really trying to do through the CAR. So again, the CAR is the Committee for Advancement of Respite Research. And our primary role was to advise ARCH on the execution of its respite research initiative that Jill just, uh, outline for everyone. We wanted to make sure that we could advance a respite research agenda that supports the activities and innovations to develop an evidence base for respite care and related services and work to explore new translational and implementation research needs, including testing of new respite models and informal respite supports, and also monitor ongoing research activities and findings, really trying to keep our pulse on what's happening in respite related research. And then finally, as has already been alluded to, ensuring that this work is aligning with the goals of the national strategy and any other nationally recognized caregiving research frameworks. If you go to the next slide, um, you'll see the priorities of the CAR. This came out of the summary of the 2020 Respite Research Summit, looking at the themes that came out of that conversation, the CAR work to evaluate that and identify our priorities moving forward. And subsequently, we formed three work groups of, out of members of the CARs around these priority areas. So the first was focused on finding and measuring the value of respite and really thinking of how to redefine that value, which we're gonna talk a little bit about today. The second work group was framed around recommending common data elements for respite related research. And again, you're gonna hear a lot more about that in our presentation today. And then um, our last work group was formed around expanding culturally and linguistically linguistically competent research with diverse populations. And that's gonna be our focus of day three. And so we're really excited that the summit has, has come to fruition to be able to share some of the outcomes of the work that we've been working on over the past few years. You move to the next slide. The uh, overall summit objectives are listed here. So we're really hoping that over the course of the next three days, we're going to help establish the foundational work of the CAR in advancing respite research and really help you really understand what we've been working on. The second is to highlight the current national, state, and local research evaluation and data collection initiatives that align with this work. So we really wanted to elevate what's already happening, um, show the alignment with existing work that, that you'll see in our panel presentations over the course of the next three days. And we wanted to also make sure we're prioritizing culturally cultural and linguistic competence in respite research. This is a really important lens that we've taken to our work moving forward. And so you'll hear those themes come up over the three days of the summit. We also wanna demonstrate the alignment of the CARS work with the national strategy. So you'll see intentional connections to that national strategy work over the next three days. And then finally, what I think is most exciting is our call to action to all of you who are listening, both live and those who may watch this recording. We wanna have you help us to continue to advance respite research. So we encourage you to um, listen, but also be thinking and sharing ideas and thoughts that you have over the next three days so we can continue to work together to advance respite research. Next slide, please. The next part of our session today is going to be focused on presenting the two main products that came out of the work of the CAR. And we are so excited to be able to share these with all of you and walk through what is included in our two white papers that were recently published. 
It has been an honor to help lead and facilitate this work. And I'm grateful, especially for my co-author, Sarah Swanson, who's gonna join me in presenting about this work. If you wanna to flip to the next slide, Marcia. Um, again, Sarah's gonna be joining me. I'll let her uh, hop on and introduce herself as well so that you can hear from her. And then we'll begin our presentation about our first uh, product from the car. And you'll hear more from me a little bit later. Hi, every Hi, everybody. My name is Sarah Swanson, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Nebraska Monroe Meyer Institute, which is the state's university center for excellence in developmental disabilities. As a member of a car and um, a co-author on these two products, I am um, just elated to be able to share them with you today. We're going to get started with um, talking about the very first product we developed, which is the white paper on measuring the value of respite and the framework. And we're just to kind of get a sense of who is in the audience. We're curious how many of you are familiar with this. So we're going to start out with a poll. Marsha, are you able to put up the poll? I am working on it. Okay. For some reason, it is not allowing me to launch it. That's okay. If you, if, if people could just respond in the chat, that would be great, whether you're familiar or not, or somewhat familiar. Okay. So it looks like we have several who are not familiar and some that are somewhat familiar. So we're really excited that you are here so that you can learn more about our work and get engaged with us. Marcia, you can go ahead in advance, I think. All right. So the purpose of the white paper is really to provide an in-depth description of the current challenges that we encounter when measuring the economic value of respite, and then also to offer a new framework for both research and evaluation efforts. Next slide. So there really is an urgent need to both identify and expand and develop evidence-based and evidence-informed respite that improves caregiver outcomes. Um, our current research and evaluation methods in respite don't currently adequately measure the economic value that we see. And caregivers need respite and accrue the benefits of respite even if respite does not save money. And we're gonna talk about this a little bit more in depth. Next slide. So here is a QR code that will take you to the white paper. And in the white paper, you're gonna see just an overview of the ARCH Respite Research Initiative. What we currently see as methods for measuring the economic value of respite, the challenges, and how we, re we are redefining the value of respite and recommendations as we go forward. Next slide. Okay. So the Centers for Disease Control says that there are three primary ways that we evaluate economic impact across programs and interventions. The first is return on investment. And this is kind of problematic because it is only looking at the financial impacts that an intervention provides to society. The CDC indicates that better approaches in, uh, include a cost-benefit analysis or a cost-effective analysis because these evaluation methods go beyond just looking at the financial impacts alone. And instead, they look at the impacts um, that, that occur to families as a whole, to communities, and to society. And so as we go forward, this is an area that we think really needs to be focused on, more attention beyond just the financial impacts. Next slide. So some of the challenges that we currently see with measuring the economic value of impact to, to respite include that because we have both informal, which is unpaid, and formal, which is paid respite providers, 
A lot of times we see in respite that the informal respite providers aren't counted in, in research. There is also limited funding and use of respite, which makes it hard to conduct large studies with large sample sizes. We also don't have um, a universal definition for respite, which you're going to see as a recommendation in our paper. And there's a um, there's also a, a lack of a definition of what constitutes a unit of service for respite. Um, caregivers also do not always identify as um, a caregiver, and we're going to talk about this a little bit further. Um, but because they don't identify that, they don't often respond to study recruitment materials. We also find that respite programs don't conduct or they don't collect consistent data. Sometimes um, there, there aren't current there aren't consistent measures across programs, and sometimes they can find this a little bit more problematic. Um, in the research agenda for respite care, the methodological challenges are discussed a lot more in depth. Great. Um, I'm going to take over a little bit from here and talk a little bit about how in this paper we try to redefine the value of respite. And this, again, is something that we're really excited to share, really proud of this value of respite model that we developed. And this multidimensional conceptual model, we feel, is a great framework for both researchers and evaluators that are interested in measuring the value of respite. This model was influenced by three existing theories and frameworks, the individual and family self-management theory, the life course framework, and the socio-ecological model. So those of you who are familiar with those models should see some of the concepts from those show up in the value of respite model. If you go to the next slide, um, this is a, a diagram that illustrates the model. I'm going to break it down into the three main domains of the model, the context, process, and outcomes over the next couple of slides. So if you go to the next slide right away, Marsha, um, you'll see that in this model, over here in the context, we try to illustrate that the main beneficiary of respite is the caregiver. However, the caregiver is interconnected with the care receiver. They have what we call linked lives. So you can see that by the arrow that is situated between the caregiver and the care receiver in the model. We know that they are hard to separate. And so they need to be considered sort of as one and connected in our work that we do. And both the caregiver and care receiver are situated in the context of their family, their community, and the policies and systems around them. And that's important context because these contextual factors are really what help either protect the caregiver or put the caregiver at risk for negative outcomes. We also try to illustrate in our model by this large arrow on the bottom that this context varies and changes over time and across the life course for both the caregiver and the care receiver. So the risk and protective factors that they may experience, let's say at the beginning of their caregiving journey may be very different than if they've been caregiving for 10 years or in a life course, another example of a life course change, you may have a caregiver of a young child with disabilities and that child's gonna, gonna grow and develop and age and we think about all the transitions that occur throughout that child's lifetime as they become adolescents, young adults, and um, how that context in inevitably changes over time and development. So this first section, again, this first domain of the model really focuses on the context and those risk and protective factors that are situated in this um, evolving context that changes over time. If you go to the next slide, you'll see the second main domain of this model is the process respite factors. And what we try to describe here is that there's this process that family caregivers go through when it comes to respite. And it starts and needs to start by identifying as a caregiver. Now, we, we, we argued about this a lot. I wouldn't say argued, debated about this a lot because we don't think that people need to be labeled as a caregiver. However, in order for a caregiver to recognize that they have access to support services that caregivers should have access to like respite, they need to know that they're a caregiver. And so it's our job as providers and those working with caregivers to help them understand that, hey, that thing you do 
we call that caregiving. You may not call it caregiving. You don't have to call it caregiving, but we call that caregiving. And as a result, you're a caregiver and you should be able to access these different supports as a caregiver. So you have to have a caregiver um, say, I'm a caregiver. Then the next step of that process is they need to have a need for respite. If they have a lot of informal support from other friends and families, they may not have a need for external respite supports, but if they are in a situation where they feel like I need a break, that's the next phase in the process. So I'm a caregiver, I need a break. And then the third step in this process is they have to be willing to accept respite. And this is where I know a lot of families, um, a family caregiver struggle is recognizing I'm overwhelmed, I need a break, but are they willing to actually use respite services? And for many families, we know this is a challenge because they lack trust, they feel guilty about it, there's different cultural norms around the use of respite services, but it's important that in order for them to access those respite services, they have to accept it. So again, we have a caregiver who says, I'm a caregiver, I need respite, I'm willing to give it a try, now there has to actually be services available for them. They have to have access to respite services and not just any respite services, respite services that meet the unique needs of that family. Again, thinking of the context of that family. I often describe this, um, this, this tailoring of respite services using what I call the five rights of respite. We need to give the right family the right type of respite in the right location and the right duration with the right provider at the right time. So there's all these factors that are important to consider for a family to have respite services that meet their needs. Not every respite service is gonna be um, a positive experience for every type of family in their situation. But let's say again, we have a caregiver who says, I'm a caregiver, I need respite, I accept it. There's this great program, it meets my needs. I'm gonna go and use this respite support. The next step in the process is they need to have their goals achieved. So if they are using that respite time to provide care for someone else or go to work or do something else that doesn't allow them the outcome of respite, it's not going to have the benefits that it's meant to have. And we're not going to see the positive outcomes or the value of respite. So uh, Becky Utz has some incredible work around time use and, and recognizing that it's important to work with families to help them establish their goals for the respite time. And so we can have families have these conversations with what are you gonna do? What's most meaningful for you to engage in during your respite time so that you can fully achieve those goals. And then lastly, the overall respite experience has to be positive. There needs to be satisfaction with the respite services, not just from the caregiver, but from everyone involved. So if the care receiver doesn't have a great time in that respite experience, that's gonna also uh, be hard for the caregiver to feel overall satisfied with that respite experience. They may have gotten a great break, but if they come back and find out the person they care for did not have a positive experience, or maybe the experience trigger behaviors that now they have to spend time supporting, um, it can become not a very positive experience overall. But if all of these factors align, we really feel that that then situates us for very positive outcomes that can occur. And then the value of respite can be measured at those various levels, the individual, family, community, or the policy and system levels. That could include the health and well-being, the quality of life, the different societal outcomes, or the cost of care. If you go to the next slide, we have some of the recommendations that came out of our white paper as well. So the first recommendation is that it's really important that in order to advance this model forward, that we are able to identify and consistently use common data elements that align with this model. And that's gonna be the second half of our presentation today. Um, we also wanna recognize that the value of respite cannot be quantified merely by financial measures, right? Like that cost of care, that cost savings, the cost avoidance, all of those things are really important. But when we talk about value more globally, it's those other outcomes to the caregivers that are really the value, I think, that we need to emphasize and support as we're um, advocating for more support for respite services. It's also really critical that the respite research that we do includes a focus on caregiver outcomes. Again, that's a premise that we have that respite is predominantly for the caregiver, though we know it has definite benefits to the care receiver and family and society as a whole, the primary focus should be on the caregiver outcomes. 
The next recommendation is that we want to make sure we're engaging the caregiver in defining the value. So what matters most to the caregivers? Are we measuring things in a person-centered way to ensure that they're culturally and contextually appropriate? We want to call all of those who are researchers and evaluators to utilize this model and the common data elements to continue to enhance our ability to compare outcomes across studies. And lastly, and often um, one of the biggest barriers is really recommending that we have additional funding to support the needed advancements in respite research. And ideally, we would love to create a unified repository or a database of common data elements that would be similar to PCORI um, and PROMISE measures that we see. So really excited to continue this work. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, we do have a, a poll question. I don't know if the poll is working yet, but if it is, we'll pop that up. Um, yes, it is. So we want to just hear from you on how likely you are to use this value of respite model in your future work. Um, we hope you all will use it. And um, we'll give it just a minute to have a few more people chime in on the poll. Okay, I think you can close it now, Marcia. So it looks like... Um, most people said they're very likely or somewhat likely to use this. So again, we hope that you do. We, we know that we gave a very brief overview of this, but encourage you to read the full white paper and um, reach out if you have questions or need support in how to adopt this model in your future work. I think for the sake of time, because we are running a little bit behind that we might save questions um, until the end. I believe the next slide, Marcia, is Q and A on the value of respite model. Feel free to post those questions in the chat if you don't want to forget them, but we'll come back to those at the end. I want to make sure we have enough time to get through the common data elements presentation. So if you flip to the next slide, we're going to move right into the companion white paper on recommended common data elements for respite research, and I'm going to pass it off to Sarah, who's going to start the presentation of this one as well. Awesome. Can I just tell you how excited I am that people are interested in using the, the model? Um, I love the model, so that just makes me super excited. We do have another poll for you, though. We are interested in, in knowing whether or not you are familiar with the recommended common data elements um, for respite research paper that we drafted. And so there should and be please a Please put this into the chat. Um, for some reason, this will not launch through the Oh, oh, wait, now it will. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad it spoke to me. <laughs> All right. I don't, okay. So it looks like most people aren't familiar or are somewhat familiar with the common data elements paper. So again, we're glad you're here so that we can share more with you about this. All right, so the, the purpose of the recommended common data elements white paper is to provide recommendations on the use of common data elements that also align with the value of the respite model, which was developed by the Committee for the Advancement of Respite Research. Next slide. So we know that family caregivers are really the backbone of our long-term services and support system. So there's really an urgent need to identify, develop, and expand the evidence-based and evidence-informed respite programs that we know improve caregiver outcomes. Current research and evaluation methods don't allow for meaningful comparison and data between studies across different populations, across different respite models, across different um, disability types or culture, and, and over time. So having common data elements is going to allow us to make comparisons. So the use of the common data elements that align with the value of respite model is essential to advancing respite research as we move forward. Next slide. 
So again, here is a QR code that will take you to um, this paper. And we're going to touch just briefly on the paper, including a little bit of background. We're going to define what common data, data elements are, the, the process and methods, and the recommended common data elements that we have come up with for respite research. And then we're going to discuss the impl impl I'm sorry, implications as we move forward. So the National Institute of Health defines a common data element as a standardized, precisely defined question that is paired with a set of specific allowable responses that is then used systematically across different site studies or clinical trials to ensure consistent data collection. It's developed so that data can be collected in the same way across multiple research studies. It also allows for meaningful comparison of data across studies between study populations, across age, across disability, across culture and time, and maybe even across um, state respite programs. And when we collect data in aggregate, it increases the statistical power of our, our data. Next slide. So there are some potential barriers for using common data elements. And this is the cost that sometimes go with um, measuring impact, the availability of psychometrically sound measures, the ease or difficulty in administering the measures from a program perspective, or even when we look at the impact on the participants. And we've been really mindful about making sure that we have chosen uh, measures that are minimal burden. Um, there's also just the relevance of the data as we move forward with your research aims. You wanna know what the purpose of the research is. Next slide. So as we move through this paper, the Committee on the Advancement of Respite Research um, work group included six members of the CAR. We met six times over a period of 18 months, which started in January 2022 through July of this year. Um, the lead author, so Kim and I met monthly, and we worked on different revisions, and we shared these back with the full group, and then met with individual members as well to get review and feedback. Next slide. So this paper really provides a very comprehensive review of the measures and the constructs that are currently used across respite and caregiving research currently. The initial draft was aligned with the value of the respite model, and we turned to the CAR and other experts for feedback, and we discussed a lot of the measures that we identified item by item, um, and initially included that in the first draft, and then we kind of teased that down a little bit, and I identified um, additional data categories and elements that we needed to more fully present the value of respite model. It really was an iterative process where there was a lot of back and forth and um, work done between larger CAR meetings. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm gonna um, pick up where Sarah left off and talk about our five basic criteria for inclusion. So as we went through this iterative process of reviewing what was available, thinking through and talking to experts of what we think we wanna recommend that aligns with the model, it came down to sort of these five main criteria. The first is we wanted to include instruments that measure concepts that align with and are essential to the value of respite models. So that was a criteria um, to make sure it fit within our framework. The second criteria was including measures that have established reliability and validity whenever possible. Um, this became a little bit of a challenge because a lot of the concepts that we're wanting to measure, there aren't existing measures. So um, we, we ended up, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what we did with that in moving forward, but we also wanted to include an individual data elements, so potentially single item questions, 
are often widely used within caregiving related fields that were essential to the model. I think um, this was something where we were able to pull from, for example, national surveys, individual single item questions as well. And then we identified concepts or individual data elements that are essential to the model or have been identified through other inductive measurement processes as important, but are not widely measured or included in the available psychometrically sound measures or in existing experimental research design. And as Sarah alluded to earlier, we really wanted to include measures um, such as instruments that had short forms that imp impose the least burden on caregiver participating in the research study. So if we were kind of trying to decide between, you know, two or three measures that were available that we thought were solid um, instruments to measure a certain concept, we looked at which one is the shortest, which one has the least number of questions to impose the least burden. And that was a criteria for our inclusion in our recommendations. If you go to the next slide, you will see, um, again, the value of respite model as a reminder, when you look at this, there are lots of pieces to this. And so we started off really ambitiously trying to think about how can we make recommendations for all the different concepts that fall within each of these um, different factors that are displayed in the model. And we thought that might be one, overwhelming, and two, not as meaningful when we're talking about trying to really get people to focus on consistent measures. And so we decided that we wanted to instead focus on what we're calling core concepts. So sort of a minimum data set, things that we think are really, really important to focus on. Of course, there's other things that we could, we could measure as well, but we feel there are some key core items that are really important for respite researchers to include. So if you go to the next slide, you will see that um, these recommended common data elements are were really identified because we recognize we can't measure every concept, but we thought it was important to have respite research include at least one concept from each of the four domains. So the idea is when you're conducting respite related research, we feel like you gotta know a little something about the caregiver. You gotta know something about the care receiver. You need to know something about that respite experience. And then you also need to include a, an outcome measure. And again, our emphasis is on caregiver outcomes. So by thinking of, you know, what am I measuring to understand and share a little bit about each of these four domains, that's what we're really trying to call out in our recommended core concept. The next slide shows um, a, a figure that is in the paper that it may be hard to read on your screen, but if you pull this up in the paper, you'll see that this is where we have our recommended core concepts. So these are the things that we think are most important to measure. So again, the idea is, you know, think about your study, what of the caregiving context and care receiver context could you measure? What, do you have, what information do you have about the respite experience and what caregiver outcome could you focus on? And that's gonna change based on the, the questions in your research or what's interesting in your evaluation, but these are sort of the recommended core concepts that we think are important. I wanna also highlight in here that we put on the bottom left of this figure, what we're calling caregiver circumstances. So these were um, different concepts that we thought really crossed over between the caregiver and care receiver. So if you remember back to the original diagram, there's sort of that linked lives, right? That the caregiver and care receiver are connected. Well, these were concepts that we felt were really interconnected that were interdependent between the caregiver and care receiver. So things like what's their relationship to each other? Um, what are the caregiving needs? How complex are the care needs? What's the caregiving intensity, for example? And so those are ones that could sort of count for either or both the caregiver and care receiver context. If you go to the next slide, you're gonna see um, that we used really three types of data elements in our recommendations in this paper. Again, when possible, we tried to identify existing multi-item measurement tools, things that are valid and reliable and, and well-known and well-used. We also tried to find items that were non-proprietary so that you didn't have to pay for these measures. Um, Oftentimes we were able to pull out single non-proprietary items from like national survey questions, things that would give us some insight, but again, a consistent way to measure those things. And then lastly, we did identify and develop some original items that we're recommending. The caution to that is that those original items have not been studied or used yet. And we're hoping that future research will help to do some validation of these items that we developed in here. And we're really excited for that 
um, hopefully by the next time we present, we'll be able to share how these original items have been used and validated in respite research. If you go to the next slide, you're gonna see just a screenshot of the, the first half of a page of our appendix that gives the recommendations. So I just wanna orient you to how this looks in the paper. So for each of the aspects of the model, so up here at the top, you can see this is the caregiver context. So again, these are the core concepts that help to describe the risk and protective factors of the caregiver. We list those core concepts on the left-hand side, and then on the right-hand side, we list what we're recommending as the common elements. So this could be either an item or a measure that we think is the most appropriate um, one to use to measure this concept. So we list that measure, and then we also list the source of it when available, and if it's an original item, we put original item. So you'll see this for each section of the model. So there's a, a bunch of co core concepts and recommended measures under the caregiving and care receiver context. If you go to the next slide, you'll see just a screenshot of um, the respite of factors and the process. These are the core concepts that help to describe the, that respite factors that are involved. And this was one where there really wasn't a lot of existing measures. And so we we're really excited to develop some tools to help measure what we think are the two core concepts within the respite factors, one being the description of the respite model and the other being the caregiver's experience with respite. And I'm going to showcase those tools in just a minute so you can see more about how we're recommending measuring these two core concepts. On the next slide, you'll see again just a screenshot of the, the beginning part of the recommendations around outcomes. So again, it's formatted similarly. You have the core concepts on the left, the recommended common data elements on the right with, um, when possible, links to those items um, when we're recommending the full measures, as well as some original items that we've listed out here. So the next slide will show you um, uh, the, the three tools that we developed as a part of this. And I'm gonna walk through each of these individually. So if you go to the next slide, we're gonna start by talking about the respite model description tool. So again, there, there wasn't a lot out in the literature uh, consistently measuring what a respite model looks like. And so this tool, again, this is just a screenshot of the beginning of it in the, in the paper, you can see the full tool um, very thoughtfully went through and um, developed a list of questions that could be used to describe key aspects of respite intervention. So again, you may not use all of these questions in your description of that respite model, um, but we encourage you to include as many as you're, you think are relevant or important or feasible given the, the evaluation or research project you're involved in, because the more we know about the respite model, the, the more we can um, decide if it's comparable to other studies. So, you know, this goes through things like What's the population that's served? Where is it located? How is it funded? Where does respite take place? All of those things that help us understand what does that actual respite intervention look like? How, how often is respite uh, provided? What's the duration? What activities are being done? Um, what level of care? What do the providers look like? All of those factors. So I encourage you to take a look at that respite model description tool. I think it's a really helpful tool. And we, we hope that people are able to use that in their work moving forward. The next slide shows, again, just the, a screenshot of the first page of the caregiver experience with the respite tool. Again, this is a tool that we developed to help researchers understand um, that respite process piece and that experience that caregivers have with respite that align with the value of respite model. Again, these are a very comprehensive tools, so it may not be feasible for you to for you to use all of these questions, but again, encourage you to include as many as possible and feasible that you could have a comprehensive description of this respite process and caregiving experience. So again, we have included questions and response options for all aspects of the respite experience. So if you remember that process flow, it's I identify as a caregiver, I need respite, I accept respite, um, I have respite that meets my needs, right? And what does that look like? What are the considerations for meeting the needs of that family? Um, they have goals and they've used their time wisely and that they have overall satisfaction. So again, in the document, you can review all the questions that we developed for this caregiving experience with the rest of the tool. And the next slide is our last tool. Again, just a screenshot to kind of get give you um, a peek at this tool, but we thought this was helpful as sort of a, a walkthrough step-by-step -step guide to help people 
use all this information that we're sharing to identify common data elements. So we start out by encouraging researchers or evaluators to think about what questions you hope to answer, like what's your what, what's your outcome? What are you really trying to understand? And then think through each of those domains. So, you know, if you if you want to answer this question, what caregiving factors do you think would help you understand that? What what care receiver factors? What rest? What caregiver circumstances? What respite process? What outcome measures would you think are most important? And it gives you a list of those recommended core concepts on the, on the second page of this document to sort of check and pick from, so that you can then match your research framework to the common data elements using the tools that are provided in this paper. So it's just a nice little handy worksheet to help you kind of walk through selecting those common elements from the recommended core concepts. Um, if you go to the next slide, you will see that um, from this, we talk in the paper a lot about some really important implications. We feel there are four re research evaluation policies. So the first is that we are really encouraging researchers to utilize these recommended common data elements. This will allow us to enhance our ability to compare across studies, which is really important when there's limited research happening around respite to begin with. The more we can consistently measure things, the more we can aggregate those results and, and, and do reviews and, and draw greater conclusions from a larger pool of data. We also think this is a very useful tool for respite programs and their evaluation work. Um, this helps, I think, position respite programs to become what we call research ready in, in ARCH terminology that, you know, respite programs have this great ability to collect other data that can help um, feed up into larger research initiatives. So if, if it's already being collected this way at the programmatic level, it makes it easier to conduct research with respite programs, which we are encouraging that those partnerships. We also think that state and federal programs that fund respite should consider adopting these and thinking about how are we um, helping to support and even incentivize respite programs to help collect some of these data indicators, especially focused on programs that are serving our historically marginalized populations to ensure that we are again, framing around equity and ensuring that we are capturing good data, not just um, for one population that respite serves, but for all populations. And then finally, we recognize that um, much of the respite money and program funding goes towards the care receiver. And therefore we need to connect with programs that are supporting respite for care receivers to also encourage them to adopt these measures, things like the HCBS quality measure set and the um, Medicaid home and community-based services, the, the HCBS evaluation tool. So, you know, we will hopefully be following up with some of those folks and excited to have others uh, joining us today for, um, examples of how this is being done. And as Bill just posted in the chat, you're gonna learn more tomorrow about the research ready programs from the innovative and exemplary respite service grantees and how they are enhancing their evaluations in order to become more research ready as well. So um, if you go to the next slide, I believe we have a um, just a, a slide with our contact information for more information. And then the next slide should have, I think, our last poll question. Again, if it's not working, oh, it's working, great. So would love to hear from you how likely you are to use some of these common data elements in your future work. Again, we hope that you all will use them in some way, shape, or form, um, thinking about how you phrase questions and how you gather information in a consistent way to help support the advancement of respite research. Um, so I think we can probably end it there. If you want to close out that poll, it looks like, again, most people are somewhat likely or very likely to be using these, and we're really excited to um, see that. I'm glad that you guys are all able to participate. So I believe we now have about 10 minutes for some Q&A from folks. So again, you can feel free to, if you want to go to the next slide, Marsha, um, feel free to post questions that you have if you think it's easier to ask your question out loud, just post in the chat that you'd like to unmute and we can unmute you. You can ask your question live to us, but Sarah and I are happy to answer any questions you have related to either the value of respite model or the common data elements that we recommended as the companion to that model. So thank you so much and look forward to your questions.
don't be shy. We like questions or comments. You maybe are just too overwhelmed with excitement to have questions. I don't know. <laughs> Um, I, I, I'll speak from, uh, you know, a little social center. I think our biggest barrier is how to get the data to you. I mean, how can we break it down into, into a uh, chewable, uh, uh, bites so that everyone can report and we can get a really, uh, encompassing, um, uh, feedback for you. We just don't know how. So if you yeah. have tools, we're here. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think we really, we mentioned this as an implication, like we do need infrastructure to support housing that data in a central repository. Um, ideally, it would be great to have um, one place where people can feed data in. And we're gonna hear a little bit about how our adult day services are doing that when when uh, Bill talks a little bit more about some of the common data element work he's been doing. Um, you know, I think in the meantime, until we have that robust ability to house that data, I think it's just connecting, you know, one-on-one -on -one with researchers, connecting with ARCH, finding collaborative partners so that we can set up our own data sharing agreements to, to work on um, collecting the information that you guys are gathering and using that for broader research. Kim, we have um, a question from Adam. He says, I just took on a respite program. So do you guys have like a generic intake packet or form you would use to start respite services? Yeah, great question, Adam. Um, we don't have that specifically as an intake form. I think that there's definitely the possibility that we continue to use the, the recommended common data elements to inform the development of other more pragmatic tools for practice that could be used for that. Um, something we could certainly work on together as a group to think about how do we translate some of this more researchy terminology into some of those more practical tools for a rest of the program. And we're very interested in doing that moving forward. So Lisa Schneider writes that she agrees with Doris who just spoke up and she was thinking are there thoughts about creating a national database for states to enter sat, you know, said data elements? I will do it if someone gives me money to do it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I would love that. That is one of my dreams to have a, a national database, um, you know, really help a lot of other research and other settings, you know, they have registries, they have systems of data collection, and it allows you to, to really um, understand things in a much greater way when you have a repository of, of data that's collected consistently. So that is the dream. I think it would be great. Um, I'm constantly looking for funding opportunities for that that align, and we'll continue to um, advocate for that. But maybe someone is listening who has a rich uncle who wants to fund this. Um, we, you never know. So if you have money, talk to me and we'll make it happen. Um, sure. Take um, Besides the time involved, it takes you know technology and support and the system. So it, it is a, a big project to undertake. Um, but great, great suggestion. I love it. I love the energy around that. Um, so Lu Luis Gorman writes, will there be a support group moving forward? Is that a support group because this is overwhelming or a support group to help like support implementing? <laughs> I think we need both. <laughs> um, so we haven't we we haven't talked yet about how we're going to be able to like help continue to nurture the implementation of this, but I know that Arch is a partner in uh, the Break Exchange Initiative that I lead, which is our international academic practice collaborative to try to connect researchers with programs to advance evidence-based respite work. And so that may be a, a place where we can continue to support the application of this moving forward. So I encourage you to, to join the Break Exchange if you aren't already a member, and we can continue some of those conversations possibly in work groups with the Break Exchange as well. Um, it could be something we we look into doing moving forward as a part of the our respite research initiative as well. I think that's a great idea to have sort of a learning community around implementing these common data elements moving forward. Sarah Toves writes, great information and presentation. Could you speak to how the definition of respite used in this work aligns with the 2022 national strategy to support family caregivers? Actions for States, Communities, and Others National Strategy 2022 directs us to use the widest possible def 
I cannot speak. Why does possible definition of respite in program and service delivery? Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. I think one of the unique things about what we're proposing is, um, you know, really in that defining the respite, respite can take many shapes and sizes, as everyone knows. So understanding the model and what the respite is, is really important. So broadly speaking, respite is, you know, anything that gives a family caregiver temporary relief from their caregiving responsibilities. That could be time away from their caregiver. It could be time with their caregiver or with their care recipient, um, doing other things or having support for their care needs. But at the end of the day, when we're talking about the research and evaluation, it, it doesn't really matter what the respite is. It's, it matters that we define it, that we are clear when we're measuring outcomes from respite, that we are also clearly defining what type of respite we're measuring. So that description of the respite model is so crucial because you can't just take and compare outcomes from this respite program that may look completely different than this respite program. That, that That's not a fair comparison. So I think it's really important that, um, you know, using that description of the respite model tool to help clearly define what it is we're talking about when we talk about respite, because respite is so broad, it can mean so many different things to so many different people. We have to be able to clearly articulate what it is we're measuring, what's the intervention that we're trying to test for positive outcomes and, and show that value um, in our outcome measures. So I think this next question just feeds directly into what you just said. Harriet Redman writes, funders seem to be confused about respite versus adult day services, et cetera, which adds to the confusion family caregivers have about respite. How will this work help us communicate the value of respite and work into goals of a care receiver? Great question, Harriet. Yeah, it's confusing. <laughs> I, I will echo that. It is confusing and funders are right to be confused. Um, again, I think defining what it is we're talking about with respite is important. So again, I, I like to, when I think about adult services as respite, I think for many families, adult day service can be respite, but if they're using adult day services to provide care for someone else or to go to work, and engage in things that are not providing them that break um, and that relief that is the outcome of respite we're looking for, it, it's not respite. And so I think it comes to, down to understanding that the person-centered outcomes, like what is the value that individual caregivers are trying to achieve from their respite experience, because a respite service may not result in the outcome of respite. And the opposite is true. You don't need a formal respite service to have the outcome of respite, but we still wanna to continue to advocate for funding for formal respite services because not everyone is gonna have access to those informal supports for respite. So it does get a little bit confusing, but I like to you know, try to differentiate it between, you know, there's, there's respite as a service and there's respite as outcome. Ideally you have, you have both, you have a, you know, someone providing you an opportunity to get respite. And from that experience, you achieve that break and relief and, and refuel and all those positive things that we know are, are really important for respite but that doesn't always happen, again, because if you remember back to our model, it's that process. Like if all those things don't line up, you may end up having a bad experience and you may actually worsen outcomes. A good example I've, I've given in the past is um, I used to run a respite program for, for kids with different disabilities. And um, I had a parent who told me that they, they loved the break they got from, um, you know, the day where their child could come and spend the whole day with us and they could have a whole day off from caring for their child. But because the child was in a very stimulated environment, it took them over a week to get their child's behaviors back to baseline because they were so overstimulated from that respite experience. So that one, you know, six hour block of time they had as a break to them wasn't worth the next week of time that they had to spend extra supporting their child's um, needs. And so again, it's it's what's what's that overall best fit for those families I think is really important. And not every respite experience is gonna work for every situation. That context is so important. Understanding the context of the family, the caregiver, um, all of those those factors that are important to, to recognize um, that is unique to every situation um, and, and trying to help match them to the best respite supports that we can. 
So I think we have time for a couple more questions. Molly George writes, we survey our caregivers after each respite event. We integrate the same questions to gauge how our program serves our participant and caregivers. Do you think we should include the recommended demographics in each survey post event or include demographics in just a once a year survey since we see mostly the same participants at each event? So if you, it's a great question. So if you are interested in mapping those post event surveys to demographics, um, I would either have some numeric way of matching them to the, the one time you ask about demographics or asking them in each event. Because sometimes those demographics may change over time, um, but you could do either. I think if you're doing demographics and just once a year and then you're doing subsequent surveys in between, it's important to have a way to map those other surveys to those initial surveys that have the demographics so that you can use the demographic information across all measures that you do throughout the year. Okay. And then maybe see. just one more question. Yeah, because yep. we're, we're yep. pushing into our break time here. Yep. Tony Abrams writes, thank you so much for this needed initiative to advance respite research. I hope I'm reading the common data elements correctly, but I don't see a measure for the care receiver outcome, only individual and family. I am curious around the thinking about around this. Yeah, great question, Tony. Um, we really the focus around the, the core measures. We felt that it's most important to understand outcomes of the caregiver. So we focused our recommended common data elements on outcome measures for the caregiver. Again, potentially, we we with additional funding and time, we can expand this list of recommendations to other concepts within the, the value of respite model. But for now, we're just making recommendations on caregiver outcomes. So we do understand that receivers and others have outcomes as well. We really want people to start thinking and framing their work with the primary outcome being on caregivers. So again, we we could talk all day about this. We thank you for um, your time. We do want to take time right now to have a self-care break. So this is your opportunity for a little bit of respite. Go refuel, um, fill your coffee or your water, um, uh, do what you need to do to take care of yourself. But we do hope that you will come back and join us in about 15 minutes. We're going to start promptly at 2.30 Eastern time where we're going to be um, sharing our uh, panel of presenters that are going to highlight how some of this work is happening in initiative planning. So I encourage you to come back and join us in about 15 minutes and enjoy your time away.